So yeah, this uh, this workshop is going to be about Kubernetes security 101, uh, some best practices to secure a cluster. Let me see. Okay. So yeah, just a little bit about myself. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, I, I work at Trend Micro as an information security specialist. I'm part of the cloud and container security research team. Uh, I'm also a member of the CNCF uh, security tag team. Now to change name, it was called SIG Security, now Security Tag Team, uh, which is like the technical advisory group for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, right? It's a volunteer work that we do providing guidance and, and creating uh, documentation in regards to uh, cloud native tools, supply chain attacks. We've published last year our um, cloud native security white paper and recently our supply chain security white paper. So uh, those are all available and free for everyone to check it out. And I just want to say before we start that I'm, I don't consider myself a, a Kubernetes security expert. Uh, as you're going to see in this workshop, Kubernetes is a very complex uh, uh, technology, I would say, and, and I've been studying for over one year, one year and a half now, and still sometimes it can be, uh, some things can be tricky. And, and so, yeah, uh, feel free to ask questions if you have them. The idea of this workshop here is to be uh, a very hands-on so that you can do it yourself as well and follow along. So I'm gonna do things very slow and, and like step by step, right? Um, yeah, and I also have a personal blog on uh, the link there, katanasac.com, where I publish some um, articles uh, at least once a month. There's also all, a list of all my previous talks uh, before um, the slides or videos if they were recorded since uh, since 2011 when I started speaking at conferences about uh, application security and all that stuff. And there is also all my contact information, my social media uh, in Twitter, GitHub, and LinkedIn. It's all Magna Logan, so you can easily find me if you want and feel free to add me and we can chat more after this uh, workshop. So the agenda for today is what is Kubernetes, right? So I'm, I'm going to assume that you either heard about Kubernetes or at least uh, um, have seen someone or, or an organization that uses Kubernetes. But in this workshop, I'm going to assume that you've never used Kubernetes, right? So uh, um, the idea is to start from scratch. So what we're going to do, um, the way that this workshop works is we're going to set up an environment on AWS. That's why the, the, there was a prerequisite of having an AWS account. And we're going to use Cloud9, which is like a virtual uh, developer environment for AWS. So we're going to deploy a Cloud9 instance and use that to uh, deploy our cluster, right? Uh, so we're, we're going to understand what is Kubernetes, the Kubernetes architecture, right? I'm going to talk about all the small components, uh, um, the, the two main components, the, the control plane and the worker nodes, and then the, each little component that's inside those those major ones. Um, as Jeff said, we're going to do some threat modeling, right? I don't know if you heard, but the, this year, in April this year, the MITRE released the attack framework, the attack matrix for containers, right? And we were part of this, this work with MITRE, right? So we partnered with MITRE when they uh, when they did this, uh, when they called the community for help and, and we provided some data regarding our uh, our honeypots. We have some Docker and Kubernetes honeypots that we use to analyze uh, attack data on those environments. So we're going to talk about that as well. Um, then later we're going to talk about, well, after we set up our environment on, on AWS, we set up a cluster, we're going to deploy a, a, a application, uh, a container, containerized application there, a vulnerable application. And so we're going to attack it, right? So we're going to understand what's going on, uh, um, how can an attacker compromise a cluster, one of the many ways that uh, that's possible. And of course, this is a misconfigured cluster, right? So that you understand the fundamentals of why it's important to keep your 
Kubernetes cluster uh, well configured and secured. And if we have time, then we're going to talk about defending Kubernetes, right? So wh what are the main uh, issues on uh, that you can like, what are the best practices, right? either regarding the API server and the whole uh, uh, process of deploying a container, uh, generating a container right from scratch and, and deploying it into a Kubernetes cluster. And, and there is many things that we can talk about here. So yeah, I hope you enjoy and, and feel free to ask questions. I know that people are monitoring those questions and, and they can send them over to me. So if you're struggling, if you're not, if you're, you're trying to follow along and something's not working for you, don't worry. Try a few free advice questions, and, and I can, we can make this uh, uh, very interactive. Okay, <clears throat> so before we start, I just want to say that <clears throat> I uh, since I started working with Kubernetes uh, last year, uh, I created this this kind of GitHub project, the Awesome Kubernetes Security List. <clears throat> And um, this project has um, has like a bunch of links and, and information that I use myself to learn Kubernetes and understand, and has a lot of stuff about Kubernetes security. So let me share that here with you so that you can take a look as well. So yeah, first this uh, um, I started with that as a like a kind of my own thing when I was studying saving links on a a text file uh, for myself, but I said, no, maybe maybe some people, other people can benefit from that as well. And and that's why I did this, this GitHub repo, which has almost, almost a thousand stars already, right? And I created that in October last year. So it, it hasn't been even over a year yet and has a lot of information. I know there's some stuff that I need to update and I'll update it soon. So so yeah, feel free to start, to fork it. And if you have any other links that are either related to Kubernetes or Kubernetes security, you can submit a PR to me and, and then uh, I'll take a look and, and add to the list as well. So there's a lot of information here. Okay, so I'll, I'll give an overview of about what is Kubernetes so that you can understand. And then we go to set up the environment and I'll continue the slides while this, the environment is setting up because it takes a few minutes to set up the environment on AWS. So yeah, let's let's do that first. So what is what is Kubernetes, right? So what is your understanding of Kubernetes if you have uh, if you have seen it, if you have used it, right? Uh, yes, Kubernetes is an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications, right? And and but what does that mean? Right. If you remember when Docker was released in 2013, right? Um, there was a lot of uh, uh, hype about using Docker and using containers and 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 uh, uh, containerizing everything, right? But quickly we learned that by doing that, there was a lot of uh, uh, it increased the overhead of management of those applications, right? Because when Docker was released, there was no way for you to uh, uh, easily manage multiple multiple containers running on multiple servers, right? And <clears throat> and so Kubernetes was was created as an idea to help manage those containerized applications, right? So it's an uh, a container orchestrator, as we say it, right? And um, they just released the latest version, which was 1.22. Right, and it has um, before, like uh, until last year, it was new versions were released four times a year, so kind of every quarter. And I think now it's three times a year, so it gets updated very quickly. Right, so you need to uh, follow along and keep yourself updated so that you also can uh, uh, keep your cluster updated. Right. Um, so uh, some of uh, quick facts and, and fun facts about Kubernetes here. It was created by Google, right, in 2014, and it's based uh, uh, on internal projects from Google, which are called Borg and Omega, right, which are closed source, right, and they they decided to Google has been used containerized applications for for uh, uh, many years now, and that's why they worked on on this project. Kubernetes means uh, uh, it's a word from Greek, 
which means helmsman, right? And helmsman is like the, the person who kind of drives the ship, the ship, right? A, a, a big ship in, in kind of a, a allusion to Docker, which are, are the containers, right? And the person kind of steering the wheel of the ship there, uh, that's, that's the helmsman, right? Um, sometimes can be the captain, sometimes it's another person, so that's why. Um, and, and that's another reason why the icon for Kubernetes is, is a helm, right? That's what we call this kind of steering wheel of a ship, right? And it's a helm. Um, yeah, uh, another fun fact about Kubernetes is it's also called KATS, right? K-A-S. And the reason for that is just because there is eight letters between K, the K and the S of, of Kubernetes, right? If you count the letters there in between the Uberneti, it's eight letters. So that's why an abbreviation of that, um, that's the way, the way that they do it. Um, another thing, Kubernetes developed in Go, Golang, right? It, it's as same as Docker and many other um, cloud native applications as well. So yeah. Okay, let's move on. Uh, why Kubernetes, right? So <laughs> since since it's important to understand what Kubernetes is, it's also important to understand why Kubernetes. Like, should you use Kubernetes in your organization, right? You, you don't want to go uh, uh, go to your uh, company on on Monday and say, no, we should move everything to Kubernetes because Kubernetes is the next big thing, right? Um, there is a lot of uh, a lot of management required to run Kubernetes clusters, right? And and I, as I said, like I think personally, from my perspective, it's a very complex system. It's hard to understand, and especially if you don't have the the, the background of what Kubernetes do in, in behind the curtains, right? So once you understand that, that gets easier to to know what it's doing. But but it's like you need to have that background, right? So yeah, just a, a kind of a, a, a comic here from Dilbert, right? It's not everything that needs to be, okay, Kubernetes, right? Doesn't mean like that. It, it's the, you have uh, very few people that really, really understand Kubernetes properly, especially even Kubernetes security. And, and yeah, it, it's, if you wanna start moving your applications to your Kubernetes cluster, then you're gonna require not just uh, uh, budget, right, resources to do that, but also uh, skilled people to maintain your clusters, right? So uh, and think about that before you go into, okay, yeah, let's let's move everything to Kubernetes. It might not be uh, the solution and it might not be uh, uh, required for your needs and your organization needs. Okay, uh, what is the CNCF, right? The CNCF is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It's the foundation, uh, uh, it's a sub-foundation of the Linux Foundation. It helps and maintain many different projects from uh, uh, what they consider cloud native, right? So Kubernetes is just one of them. There are many different others that you can see here. And some of them are even part of Kubernetes as etcd and core DNS and also Helm to, to, to uh, package um, Kubernetes applications as well. So there's many different ones, right? So it doesn't mean just Kubernetes. When we're talking about cloud native uh, uh, CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and, and cloud native security, we're not just talking about Kubernetes, right? This is the, um, the URL there at the bottom, the l.cncf.io. If you go there, it's going to show you a lot of uh, different projects that are related to cloud native, right? And, and just a quick thing here about uh, um, what what means to be uh, uh, cloud native, right? Doesn't mean that the application only runs in the cloud, right? And we're going to talk probably going to talk about that in the next few slides. But just just to add to that, uh, um, being cloud native is is there is different characteristics on applications that they uh, they have, and they are more they're 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 created to run in cloud native cloud environments. But they can also run on premises, right? There are there are organizations and and, and uh, many different companies that run Kubernetes on premises, right? Okay. Yeah. So that's the slide here. As I said, like 
what it, what it means to be cloud native. The definition here, it's from the CNCF itself and can be found on their GitHub. And basically, uh, um, as they say, to a cloud to an application to be cloud native, it needs to have these characteristics on the left, your seven characteristics. And some examples here that you probably are using or you probably heard about, right? Containers, service meshes, microservices in general, immutable infrastructure or, or infrastructure as code, and declarative API. So these are some examples of cloud native applications. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to stop here. Before I go into the architecture and explain all the details, I'm going to share my uh, my screen and, and try to uh, have everyone follow along to set up their environment. Okay. So let me stop sharing. Let's see if it can. Oops, can share again. One second. Uh, okay. 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 Can you see my screen? Yeah, good. So the uh, one of the prerequisites of the workshop, uh, as we mentioned, is having an AWS account, right? So go uh, if you are not logged in on your AWS account, please go ahead and log in. And and what we're gonna do, as I said, like we're going to deploy a, a, a Cloud9 instance, right? Which is this service from AWS, and we're gonna find out very soon how it works. It's basically an online version of VS Code. Um, so if you use VS Code before, you, you're gonna find it very easy to follow along. And from that, right, the idea of why, why I'm using this, right? The idea is that I wanna make sure that everyone has the same environment, right? And so if you're using, I didn't want to like create a VM and, and deploy and, and send it to you to download and everything. Let's let's do it online, right? And using Cloud9 is a good way to, everyone is going to have the same environment if we use the same uh, uh, configuration here. And then from there, we, we can set up the instance to deploy the cluster uh, afterwards, right? Once we have the Cloud9 instance set up and that takes, uh, that's, that's very quickly, but then we configure the cluster on AWS as well. So, okay, let's start here. And I'm gonna create one from scratch. I have some created here, but I'm gonna create a new one. So let's see, Cloud, Cloud Village, right? Workshop. So name the name you can, can give any name that you want, right? Just So just remember if you have different uh, Cloud9 instances, but yeah, you can add a description as well. Here, um, you have the settings of the environment of your Cloud9 is. It's going to deploy your EC2, right? So the way that Cloud9 works, it, it, it's deploying an EC2, but it's going to configure it. And that's going to work as an online developer developing platform, right? So it's, it's basically an online VS code that's hosted on AWS so that you have a, a, a all your code there if you want, you can use that as well. Um, so yeah, basically it's going to create a new EC2 environment, right? The idea here, you can use T2 Micro, right? Uh, um, which is free, uh, free tier, if you have free tier. Um, yeah, just an another note here before before we move on. There might be some charges, because not because of this Cloud9, but once we deploy the cluster and EKS and everything, uh, uh, depending on how long, you leave the cluster online, there might be some small charges on, on, on your uh, credit card, on your account, right? But, but at the end of the workshop, I'm gonna show how to remove everything so that you don't leave anything uh, running and, and don't get charged a lot of money, okay? Sounds good. Okay, so here, if you're all there, um, basically, we're going to create a new C2 instance uh, I'm, it doesn't matter, like I don't need a large instance for the Cloud9 instance because I'm only dealing with code and executing some commands there. So that's fine. Uh, the platform can be uh, uh, Amazon Linux 2. And I can leave this everything default here after the 30 minutes of uh, idle time. If I'm not using the Cloud9 instance, uh, it's gonna shut down uh, automatically here. So I can leave everything here uh, as it is, right, by default. 
and I'm on the right region. Yeah, I'm on US East one. So I'm gonna deploy it on US East one. The cluster I can deploy anywhere and, and we're gonna see how to do that. But basically for the Cloud9 instance, make sure that everyone on, is on the same uh, 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 same region and they have this access to the same features, right? That's that's the only, uh, the, the only reason for that. Okay, here just uh, um, an overview of, of the settings that I set up. Basically, everything is default right now. Uh, we're going to create a new role for, for uh, my instance later, but let's, do, let's leave it at that right now. Okay, so it's, it's creating my environment. It might take a few seconds to minutes, right? And this is going to be like, if you use VS Code before, or if you work with uh, coding and, and programming in VS Code, you're gonna find it very, interface is very similar. There is a few things that we need to do here uh, um, once the environment is set up. And, and so creating an IAM uh, role for our instance and also disabling some credentials. So I'm gonna show here once the Cloud9 is, is, is completed. And, and deployed, right? Um, let me see. See if it's taking a lot of time. Yeah, let me go back. Um, yeah, if I have, um, I don't know if, if I have, we have any questions so far, but yeah, feel free to ask them. If you're stuck, if you if you're like you missed something uh, 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 until now, feel free to uh, send the questions over through the the, the form, the Google form. Okay, no question. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you. So yeah, let's let's let me wait here once. Okay, now the cloud name, the cloud nine instance is set up. As you can see, it's basically an IDE platform uh, uh, online. Uh, I have a terminal here. Um, I can add new files and new terminals as well. Right. Okay. So what we're going to do? Let me. New terminal. Okay. Is the font good enough uh, for everyone to see? I don't need, maybe, yeah. let's leave it at that. Okay. So this is basically the environment that we're going to use to uh, uh, deploy our cluster from, right? Okay, so a few things that we need to set up here and I'm gonna show you is, oops, sorry. It's on this uh, settings here on the top right corner of my uh, uh, interface. There's uh, a gear icon called preferences, right? And in this gear icon, I need to go to uh, AWS settings. And on the AWS settings, I'm going to disable this AWS manage temporary credentials, right? All I need to do is click here and disable that, and that should be fine, okay? Everyone got that? Preferences, go to AWS settings and disable the AWS manage temporary credentials, good. So after that, um, let's see, let's, now we're going to, uh, let's see, let's, let's create the, now we're going to back, go back to the AWS console to create, to create uh, uh, the IAM role that I need to give to this uh, EC2 instance because the Cloud9 is an EC2 instance to be able to have permissions to, to deal, to talk to EKS and, and create clusters. Yes, the workshop is going, is, is being recorded and it's going to be shared later as well. So yeah, fine. Okay, let me go back to the AWS console here. Let me open another tab. And I think I need to share, stop sharing this one and share the other one. Sorry about that. Okay. So yeah, on, oops. I think I'm in the console. Yeah. On AWS console, what we're going to do is create an IAM role and, and please don't do this on your production account because what we're going to do is create an IAM role with a, a, 
administrator permissions, administrator privileges, so that we can give uh, um, can give the Cloud9 instance permissions to create the cluster and everything, right? So that we don't have any issues, we don't face any issues, we're going to give this administration uh, role. So I'm going to IAM and let me, let me go back. So what I did was, okay, I went to IAM, which is the, the identity and access management uh, uh, service from AWS. And basically what we're going to do is create a role um, for that. Uh, create role. I go here to roles on the left side and create role. And here uh, I select AWS service that's selected by default, EC2. Okay. And then I click next in permissions. Under permissions, it's going to load and it, I'm going to give this role administrator access to my account, right? So be very careful with that. Don't use that in, in a production environment. I, we don't want that because that's too permissive, right? I don't want to give that IAM role. This is just for the workshop so that we don't uh, uh, don't have any issues deploying the cluster. Uh, you can add tags, but that's not needed. And role name, uh, uh, C9, I'm gonna do cloud, cloud nine instance role, okay? You can put any name, just remember that name because you need to attach that to your Cloud9 instance, okay? So what I did was just repeating what I, what I did was I went to IAM, I went to row and create a new row, selected EC2 and gave uh, the policies administrator access and created a name for it, right? That's it. Okay, the role, the role has been created. So the next thing that I need to do is go back to, uh, I'm going to the EC2 now and attach that role to my EC2 instance, my Cloud9 EC2 instance, right? Uh, so I'm going to EC2 here. That's why I tap EC2 and okay, to see my machines running, I see that there is an instance running. Make sure that you're on the same region that you deployed your Cloud9 instance. And basically see, there is this instance running here. That's that's why uh, I have the, the Cloud9 running as well. So select the instance here, the EC2, and uh, on actions, security, modify IIM role, okay? That, that's going to, uh, we're going to attach that role that we just created to this instance. So again, select my instance, go to actions, security, and modify IAM role. And here I have my role that I just created, the Cloud9 instance role, and I'm gonna give it, to, I'm gonna attach that to the instance and I'm going to save. Okay, if you got, uh, get this message, so successfully attach your role to the instance, that's that's great, that's what, all we need so far. Um, is, is anyone uh, behind? Does anyone have any questions? Anyone struggling with something? Feel free to ask, okay? So now that I set this up, uh, I need to go back to the Cloud9 and install a few things on my Cloud9 instance to uh, be able to deploy the cluster, right? So some things I'm going to install is uh, uh, kubectl, um, some some other packages, so we're going to follow along. Let me share that with you. Uh, let's see if I have it here. Uh, okay. Yes, let me share my, let me go back to my Cloud9 instance because I'm not sharing that. Yeah. Sorry for the switching here, but I don't want to share any, any sensitive information, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm here. One of the things that I need to do here on the Cloud9, I've attached. Remember, if you haven't done the AWS settings, right? Disable that as well. Just let me show it again, right? The temporary credentials. And yeah, okay. 
So you can see that there is a kind of a, a directory structure here which shows your environment. I can have many uh, terminals and all that stuff. That's great. So now we're going to um, use this uh, this project on GitHub and, and to download two files that that's all I need to set up my cluster basically of and I'm going to install uh, some some package and some tools but basically those two files it's all I need to set up my cluster um, so let me show you here Git clone and this URL the Kubernetes SAC 101 workshop if you download that you can see that there's basically two files there and I'm going to explain what they are soon. And I'm going to increase the font. Let me close this. I don't think we're going to need this. Okay. Show me here. Uh, yeah. So you can see that there's two files here, two YAML files, right? And if you haven't played with YAML before, that's, that's something that uh, Kubernetes uses a lot, right? To um, to manage, uh, to deploy applications and objects on Kubernetes, right? They're all usually YAML files that that turn into JSON or sent to the Kubernetes API server. And I'm gonna explain that soon. Um, so if you haven't cloned this, so the command is git clone. Let me post the whole command there, git clone. Uh, I'll share it with the, um, the people participating and yeah. If you clone that, if you have those two files on your on your Cloud9 instance, you're good. Okay, so far you're good. Let's 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 move along. So now, uh, um, this this Cloud9 instance is is brand new, right? So I don't have. If I try to use kubectl, which I'm going to explain soon what it is, but it's basically a CLI to uh, kind of talk to your Kubernetes cluster. Um, so I don't have that right now, right? Command not found, that's not installed. So I need to install that. So the first command to install uh, um, kubectl is this one here, let me see. Uh, okay. Let me post that on the chat. And so this is the first command here and I'm going to share with you. So basically I'm downloading that uh, uh, from AWS, let's see if that's done. Okay. So now I should have, uh, oh, I need to give it permissions, of course. The second command is to allow execution permissions to this binary, right, kubectl, and don't worry, I'm going to explain everything once we, once we start deploying the cluster, which is the, the thing that takes uh, uh, longer, then we go back to the slides and I'm gonna explain some things that I'm doing here if you may not, uh, uh, if you're not uh, able to understand yet, but you you will be able to understand, no worries. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so kubectl is working, right? We have that already now. kubectl controls the Kubernetes cluster manager, that's great. Um, other things that we can install that's gonna help you um, with our interaction with the cluster. So let's start a few, a couple packages uh, um, that can help you win. And those packages are JQ and, and uh, GetTax and batch completion, right? So basically what I'm going to do is sudo uh, uh, yum install those packages, right? Because they don't have that on the, on the Cloud9 instance by default. Great. Now I'm going to uh, uh, configure a batch completion to keep CTL so that helps me when I'm managing my cluster right, and using commands with, with kubectl. So basically kubectl completion bash, bash completion, and um, another one here. Let me, oops, let me post those two commands to the team as well so they can share with you yeah. Okay. So those are two separate commands that you're doing. And let me let me clear here so that I move to the top. Okay, that's better. Um, okay. Any any questions so far? Anyone struggling? Any comments that you don't understand? There's just a, a couple more things that we're going to do. Now we're going to install EKS CTL, right? And and what EKS CTL is 
is uh, 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 another binary to interact and, and, and help you deploy EKS clusters, right? And what is EKS? EKS is the managed Kubernetes services from AWS, right? So it, it's it's like a, a, a Kubernetes that's provided to you by AWS and AWS manages that, right? Every major cloud provider has their own manage Kubernetes services. You have EKS for, a, uh, uh, for AWS, you have AKS for Azure, you have GKE from Google, and, and many others, right? Okay, so we're going to install the EKS CTL uh, uh, binary because that's what you're going to use to deploy the cluster. Once the cluster is deployed, excuse me, we just use kubectl, basically. Okay. So let me set that up. This is the command. Um, I'm posting that to the team so they can share with you too. Sorry. Uh, okay. Moving that to the local bin and also enabling bash completion for EKS CTL. And that's it. Okay. And yeah, CTL. Okay, that's working too. Great. So so far we've only uh, downloaded a few packages, installed kubectl, and installed EKS CTL. That's what the two main binaries that we're going to need to uh, uh, deploy our cluster. Right? People may ask, oh, why why don't we need to install Docker? Right? We're not. We're not running our cluster here on this instance, right? We're running that on, uh, we're going to deploy two new instances, actually one new instance to uh, uh, to run our cluster, right? And the way that uh, uh, EKS works is that on, uh, they they run, they manage the control plane, right? Of, of the Kubernetes cluster. And we only need to deploy our worker nodes. And that, well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to deploy a Zing C2 instance that's going to work as our worker node to run our applications. Okay, let's see. No questions so far. Oops, thank you. Download link for. Sure, let's see. This is the whole. Yeah, this is the whole link. Yeah, maybe if it's truncated. Yeah, that's that's the whole link. Basically, I'm downloading the kubectl binary. If you want to download that from directly from Kubernetes, uh, uh, the Kubernetes website, which is Kubernetes.io, there is also a kubectl there. But I'm downloading that from AWS from. Uh, 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 an S3 on AWS that that they provide, right? So that's that's better. I think I'm, I don't think you're gonna have any issues if you download from from the Kubernetes.io website. Um, but yeah, if that doesn't work uh, with the link, please please let me know. Okay. So so far we we configure just just to give you like a. Um, Overview of what we've done, if, if you just joined the, the workshop, we deployed a Cloud9 instance, we configured an IAM role for this instance, and then we downloaded uh, the two files from a GitHub uh, uh, that we're going to use to set up the cluster, and then we installed kubectl and ekstl. That's all we did, and, and don't worry if you don't understand some of those names and tools, I'm going to explain that as soon as we de start deploying our cluster and move back to the slides. And I just, I just should, don't want to waste uh, too much time. Um, so I want to do the setup first. If if uh, people haven't been able to do that, and and then we go to the slides while the cluster is is being deployed. Okay, let's see here. Um, so basically, what we're going to do. is, okay, to create this cluster, I'm going to use, let me show the files first. Let me go back to the files. Uh, okay. 
So the first file that we're going to use is, uh, that we're going to interact with is this eks-cluster.yaml, right? This is going to deploy my cluster on AWS. So that's why we installed EKS, that's going to help me. And, and here on this file, you can see the command here already, right? Um, that's, that's what we're going to do. Basically run this command on the terminal, uh, of course, pointing that to the file that we have. And basically uh, um, I'm deploying a cluster configuration, right? And um, this is the name of, of my cluster. This is the region. So here you may be able to change your region if, if EKS is available uh, on the region that you are in, right? And it's also a good idea because if we deploy all, uh, I don't know how many people are following along and deploying clusters as well, but if we all deploy our clusters on the same region, we might run out, out of resources. So the way that it works on AWS, they have a limited resources for uh, availability zones, right? So inside that region, there's different uh, availability zones, and we might come, uh, we might have some errors saying that you don't have enough resources to deploy that cluster in that region or on that availability zone. Because EKS CTL, they're going to choose from this from this uh, uh, um, this configuration here. They are going to choose which availability zone on US East One region. Uh, uh, they want to deploy a cluster. We we don't manage that. Of course, we could we could add that to the configuration file, but I don't want to add a lot of uh, uh, overhead to the configuration. So you don't need to worry about that. And on this cluster, I'm creating a manage node group, right? And I'm calling that manage node group one, and I'm deploying an instance uh, of the size T2 small, right? And here I can say the minimal size and the maximum size. That means that my cluster uh, uh, can have only one worker node, only one instance, and maximum three, right? So if I need to increase uh, uh, the number of worker nodes on my cluster, I can easily do that, right? And if I like, if I can change that to 10, it doesn't matter. What's going to matter here is the desired capacity. Right? That's what what's the cluster is going to start with, right? If I change that to three, for example, then it's going to deploy three different EC2 instances of the same size in the node group, right? And I, I don't want that. I don't want I don't want three. I don't want to. We're going, only going to use a small web application, so I, I don't want that. I just want one, so that it doesn't. I don't need to pay a lot of money uh, for for deploying this cluster, right? This is the volume size, right? The hard drive and some labels, the worker uh, uh, labels, the worker role, right? And that basically that's it, right? That's that's all that is on my cluster. So here, I'm gonna use this command. Let me go to the HSA workshop. Here is my EKS cluster. So I just entered the directory of the uh, of the GitHub project that I just downloaded. Again, it's it's just Git if you haven't. This is say how many options do you like? Sure. Okay. Um yeah, maybe maybe the chat. Let me let me share the the whole file here. One second. Some people are struggling with the commands, the first commands. And then give me a few seconds here. So I put that in a drive and, um, and I can share that. One second. Hang on. I mean, I should have done that before. Sorry about that. Uh, Okay. Okay, let me share 
on this file here. I created a Google Docs and I will share the link of the Google Docs of all the commands. And, um, and then we can share with everyone participating so that they can check. Let me just Kubernetes 101 workshop that quickly. Okay. Yeah, I'm sharing on the Google Docs. Um, so if you can share that link with everyone, everyone can see that link. And these are the main commands that we did to uh, um, set up kubectl and ekstl on the cluster. So if you're having any trouble, um, some of those are, are two commands, so remember that. Uh, yeah, step one, step three, so follow that along and ch check out the commands there. If you're still struggling after following that, let me know, please let me know. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll move on here and I'll deploy my cluster and, and while that's that's going on, uh, as we go in back to the slides, I can help anyone that's struggling or answer any questions, right? So yeah, as I said, Right, I, I want to create my cluster, and to do that, I'm going to use EKSCTL uh, to do that. And the command here is EKSCTL create cluster, right? And I'm pass, passing a, a file, uh, which is the one, this file here that I have. So this is the command, and I'll add that to the, the spreadsheet as well, so um, so that you can follow along if you uh, if you get stuck or something. Um, let me add that to the spreadsheet so that everyone can see how uh, deep clone, right? Psych 101 workshop. Okay. I'm, ad I'm adding that to the, to the uh, sorry, to the uh, Google Docs. Just adding that there so that you can see. Okay, let's see if that's going to work. Yeah, live demos or live workshops are always, are always hard. So here I started creating my cluster and as you can see, KSCTL always doing its job. It's creating a, a subnet, it creates a VPC and, and does everything for me. So that makes things easier, right? And um, this is what takes a little bit longer you might face some errors here uh, because of resources if you're doing on on the same region if you're, everyone's doing on us east one uh what, what you need to do basically is either try on a different region or try again but change the name of your uh cluster so that it doesn't uh, uh what what this is doing actually ekstl is using cloud formation to deploy your cluster right as you can see here it's waiting for the cloud formation stack and all the stuff and so if you try to deploy and it didn't work, then if you try to deploy again with the same name, it's going to complain to you, oh, there's already some uh, cloud formation template created with the same name. And let's hope we don't have, we don't face the issues, these issues. I faced that uh, on the previous uh, uh, edition of this workshop that I did, but let's hope not. It seems that no issues so far. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna leave it running here i'm going to go back to the to the slides so that we can continue the just the explanation of the kubernetes architecture and then once the cluster is deployed we come back here to uh, uh to deploy the applications and and now play along with the uh, uh attacking the application and all that stuff okay so let me stop screen and share the slides again. Okay. So yeah, we stopped we stopped here. We stopped here, right? The Kubernetes architecture. And so as we can see, if if you if you're struggling, feel free to ask questions. I'll I'll, I'll stop and answer them uh, uh, while I'm explaining a problem. Don't worry. As we can see, there's two main major components here. There is the Kubernetes control plane. It used to be called master node, but for in inclusive language, we don't usually, we don't call it anymore. Even on the new version of Kubernetes, it doesn't say, I think it does say, but it's being deprecated, the name master node, right? So I'm gonna call it uh, from now on control plane. 
And so this is on the left side here with, with five, five smaller components. On the right side of the slides, we have three worker nodes, right? And, and the worker nodes are the ones that we use to deploy our applications. And, and today in this workshop, we're deploying only one worker node, only one EC2 instance that's going to function as, as the main uh, uh, the main node for deploying our, our vulnerable web application. We don't need three, but if we need it, as I showed there with the, the max size and the desired capacity on, on the YAML file, we could easily change that there, right? Okay. Awesome, awesome, yeah. Yeah, I should have thought about the Google Docs. <laughs> um, so yeah, on, on this, on let's look at the left side first. The Cube API server, um, the Cube API server here in the middle, right? We see that that's kind of a, a, a big thing. It's a main component, one of the main components of the control plane. Every other component is talking to the API server and you can see from the arrows there. It's not just talking with the uh, uh, components from the control plane, but it's also talking to uh, the worker nodes as well, right? And the Cube API server, it's it's basically a, a, a API server and REST API server, if you played with, with APIs before, and that receives and, and forwards all the communication from all the components of Kubernetes, right? It has a, a um, basically everything that you, you, you type from kubectl, it becomes an API request, right? An HP request that goes to the API server uh, uh, of your cluster, right? On the bottom here, on the bottom uh, left, we have at CD. And at CD is, is the main database, the data storage of your cluster, right? It's a key value store where all the components of your Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster is stored there, right? And, and so everything gets saved there as a, a as an object, as a key value store, and then uh, Kubernetes tries to check that and tries to create whatever you told it to create on the that's saved on that CD, tries to create that on your nodes, okay? And that's something very important here because the, the Kubernetes works, in, uh, the way that Kubernetes works, it's called desired state, right? So Kubernetes is, is smart enough Right, it's smart enough to see that it, it constantly it's constantly checking if whatever I told it to create, for example, nodes or application or services, whatever I told it to create there on that CD, it checks it checks on your nodes and see, okay, is this application running already? Do I have free replicas of that application? Right? If I do, okay, good. That's that's the desired state. If I don't, if whatever is, is, is on that CD, whatever configuration is there, doesn't match what's running on the cluster, then, okay, I need to fix it, right? I need, they need to match, right? And so, so if, if let's say I, I only have one replica of my application and I need three, Kubernetes is going to check that and it's going to tell the cluster to create two more uh, uh, applications, two more containers, right? Actually it's pods, but it's going to create those to match those in, in that CD. So I need to have three replicas running on my cluster and it doesn't matter on, on, on which worker node, depending on your configuration as well, but I need to have that matching, right? So it's constantly checking. If you check the logs of Kubernetes, it's, it's constantly, there is many different uh, uh, components that's constantly checking to see the desired state. If whatever is on SCD should be reflected on, on your, your whole cluster, on your work, worker nodes, right? So you can see here that the API server and SCD, there are two major components of your Kubernetes cluster. And that's why you need to protect those. And we're going to talk about uh, security, the security part of, of it and the best practices as well but be very careful with those components, right? If an attacker has access to your ad CD and they can change objects there, right? Basically, whatever they change to, Kubernetes is going to just follow along. Just Kubernetes is going, okay, if you want me to create, a, a deploy a malicious container, I'm going to deploy a malicious container, right? It's, it's not, 
it's not checking who who put that information there it's only checking if the information that cd is matching whatever is created on the cluster okay and on the top left here we have the cube controller manager right and the cube controller manages exactly this object that control that has a bunch of different controllers, the pod controller, the service controller, and other controllers that keeps talking to the API server and checking on that CD. Hmm, is it matching? Is it is it oh do we have the right number of pods? Oh, we have five here, but but we need 10, right? And so it's constantly checking that then each specific controller is doing that. The cl cloud controller manager on the top right of the control plane is the one that talks to cloud providers, right? That's the reason why Kubernetes can uh, uh, work with different cloud providers. You have the cloud controller manager if you want to use like disk volumes or load balancers, right? Kubernetes doesn't have those objects, doesn't have uh, uh, those services. So you need to use the ones provided from your cloud provider. And we're going to do that on, on EKS today. We're going to deploy a load balancer to expose our application to the internet. Okay, good. And on the bottom right uh, is the cube scheduler. The cube scheduler is exactly the one that tells uh, uh, the worker nodes to deploy the pods, right? To start the containers, right? It talks to the kubelet on each worker node to schedule uh, a pod. It can be scheduled like instantly, right? And it can be uh, 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 to kubelet to talk to the Kubernetes runtime engine, create those pods. Okay, so those are the five main components of the control plane, right? Now, let's talk to let's let's take a look at the the worker nodes. Here on the on the right side. There are three main components on each worker node. I have a kubelet, I have a kube proxy, and I have the container runtime engine, okay? So basically the kubelet is the agent that runs on each node that talks to the API server and starts any, any containers and also gets some uh, statistics and health information about those, those containers, right? And I'm I'm, I'm talking I'm, I'm saying containers here, but it's actually pods. But I'm going to explain that once we move to the next slides. That the smallest unit of Kubernetes is actually pods, right? Um, there is also the kube proxy component that uh, that handles all communication, networking communication inside the cluster, but also externally, right, with outside uh, the cluster as well. And the kube uh, the container runtime engine which by default was Docker. And, you know, there was some, a lot of discussions about when, uh, when they're talking that Docker was going to be deprecated in Kubernetes and all that stuff. I don't know if you heard about this, this story, but you can still use your Docker uh, uh, containers on Kubernetes. Nothing is going to change. It's just that uh, um, the, the, the reason being that Kubernetes to, to, to be able to run Docker, Kubernetes developed a, a kind of a, another component called the Docker shim to be able, because Docker doesn't follow the, the, the OCI, the open container interface. And Kubernetes was created to, to run any OCI uh, uh, standard containers, right? Okay. So you can deploy that. The, the kubelet is going to talk with the Kubernetes runtime engine, and that's what's going to really create your, uh, your containers and, and run that on your nodes, okay? Any questions about this architecture here so far? So we're going to interact, right? What we're doing, what we're doing here today on this workshop, we're using the Cloud9 instance to talk to the control plane Right, we're using that, and tell we're going to tell the control plane to create some objects for us. Right, we we just with the EKSTL command that we just used that's creating the cluster. Let me just quickly see that. Yeah, it's still creating. Um, with the EKSTL command that we used to create the cluster, um, it, it's Kubernetes is doing that, and and the way that it works on EKS we don't have access to this control plane, right? Because uh, 
AWS handles that for us. And, and that's a good thing because you also don't need to worry about the security aspect of the control plane. All you need to do, you talk to the API endpoint of your control plane and you tell it to create, uh, uh, create applications, deploy containers and all that stuff. Um, if you're still having uh, issues deploying the cluster, if you're having, uh, if it's saying that's not available, it doesn't have any resources on that availability zone, try to change uh, uh, change regions, right? If it's still not working under different names, if it, you're still getting errors, I'm gonna show, once my cluster is completed, I'm gonna show you the, the outputs of the console and see if the, you're getting that, but try to change different uh, 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 regions if not working on, on the region. Sure, uh, the OCI is the Open Container Initiative, right? It's like a, a standard for uh, it's a standard for creating containers, right? And the Docker didn't doesn't apply uh, doesn't like it's not co in compliance with that standard as far as I know. Please please correct me if I'm wrong. And and so Kubernetes couldn't couldn't run Docker containers by default they had to create another software that's called the Docker Shim to be able to do that. So the problem is that this, this component that allows Kubernetes to run Docker containers is, uh, um, is like, it's maintained by the Kubernetes team. Uh, yeah, sure, sure, okay, sounds good. Um, so what, what, what's going on is they don't, they didn't want to maintain that component because that component was, as they call it, the Docker shim, S H I M is, is a kind of a, like, uh, it's not a good practice what they did, right? Because Kubernetes should be able to run OCI standard, com, uh, containers by default, but unfortunately Docker is not, uh, uh compliant with that. So they said, oh, I'm no, we're not going to maintain the Docker shim anymore. And the Docker shim was going to be deprecated, right? So that's why this caused a lot of stir on the, on the internet and on Twitter uh, a few months back because people thought, oh, maybe like Kubernetes is deprecating Docker. I'm not going to be used to use, be able to use my Docker containers and Kubernetes anymore. What's going on, right? Because Pretty much, I, I would say 90 to 95 or 99% of uh, Kubernetes clusters are running Docker containers and not the other ones, right? You, you can have different runtime engines. You can have the container, uh, uh, the container D, Cryo, or Podman. You can, there's different ones. But since Docker was the default one, people usually use that, right? And and because Docker is, is very well known and people have uh, 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 have used Docker before, even before Kubernetes, that's, that's what they use, right? So I think that's, that's, that's it with the OCI. There is a blog post, I think, let me see, Docker, Kubernetes, deprecated. There, is a, there was a blog post on the Kubernetes website that talks about that, that whole, that whole issue. Um, let's see. Okay. Yes. So let me post that link here. Yeah, Dr. Shin uh, FAQ. Okay. Let's move on. If, if everybody got the kind of the overview of the architecture here, let's move on with that. So as I said uh, um, before, right, we're, when we deploy a container on Kubernetes, we're not deploying a container itself, we're deploying a pod, right? So the pod is the smallest unit on a Kubernetes cluster, right? The pod can have one container inside that pod or multiple containers, right? So as the diagram here shows, uh, um, right? You can have one, two, or many, right? And, and the reason being is that the idea of containers is to run only one process on that container, right? So if I have my application running 
on my container and I need something to, let's say, collect the logs and, ch and ship those logs to a central location, right? I don't want to install that application inside my application container because that's going to break the principle and, and the idea of containers, right? So I deploy another container on the same pod, usually on the same pod, and that other container talks to my first, my application container and collects the logs from there to ship it to another location. So that container is usually called a sidecar container, right? It can be used to, to collect metrics, logs. It can be used a, a, as a security container as well. Some tools, some security tools deploy, uh, deploy the, the way that they work, they're deployed as a sidecar as well. So there's different, uh, uh, um, different usage for that, that sidecar container, right? And since they're on the same pod, right? They, they share the, their, uh, the namespaces there. Um, so other objects that you can have on Kubernetes is a deployment, right? You can, you can deploy a pod by itself, but you wanna use the features provided by Kubernetes, right? And the, the, the way the deployment works, it, it's, it gives Kubernetes or, or your Kubernetes objects scaling uh, updates and rollback abilities, right? So let's say if I need to create another pod to handle traffic and there is a lot of traffic on my application, I can easily do that with deployments. If I need to scale up or scale down as well, right? if, you, if I'm not using all those containers and, and I can save money and reduce the number of containers that are running, then uh, the number of pods, I can do that as well with a, a deployment. Right? Deployment is just an API, a Kubernetes API object, right? It's not something that that exists on, on the, the node itself. It only exists inside my cluster. It's just a configuration and the way that they use. There's many different objects that I'm gonna show on the next slide. We're not going to be able to cover all those objects here, but just to give you an overview, okay? And on top of the, that deployment, we have something called namespaces. And those are different than the, the Linux kernel namespaces. These are Kubernetes namespaces, right? And, and the way that the namespaces work here is that they work like a, um, if you're just a logical separation of different applications that I have on my cluster, right? It's basically folders inside my cluster, right? There is no kind of a, a security boundary between those namespaces, right? So I can have a namespace for my uh, developer environment, a namespace for my QA environment, and a namespace for my production environment. I can also have a namespace for my developer team one and my namespace for developer team two if they're both using the same cluster, right? So, and we're going to talk about namespaces as well here, which is another part uh, in another slide. And, and on top of the namespaces, there's nodes, right? Nodes is basically the, the server that's running my application. So it can be a, a VM, it can be an EC2 instance, it can be also a, a, a Fargate on AWS or other kind of serverless uh, uh, applications or service serverless uh, 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 runtimes or workloads. So it can be anything. It can also be running on-prem and can be bare metal as well. There's, there's also some, uh, uh, some companies that provide Kubernetes running on bare metal. Okay, and let me go to the API objects. So there's, as I said, there's different API objects that you can create on your cluster. You have a pod, as I mentioned, right? There is replica set, which is, is used by the deployment to replicate your pods. There is daemon set, stateful set, right? The deployment itself, as I mentioned, there's service that's used to expose uh, uh, either like a port or, or, or my uh, my application to the world. They can expose that through a load balancer um, as well. There is job and cron job, which are used to uh, uh, just, the, the job contain, it's basically a, a pod or a container that runs only once the job. And the cron job, it's basically a container that runs according to the cron tab, right? I, 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 I apply the configuration there, and it can run. It can run periodically, like every every other minute, every other hour, whatever I choose, and whatever I configure on the cron tab uh, configuration of that container. 
Um, there is also config maps and secrets, right? Config maps and secrets are usually uh, used to store information, right? Config maps is for configuration information that are not really sensitive. And secrets are supposed to store secret information, right? Sensitive information. But he, I'm, I'm just going to say here that secrets are not really secret in Kubernetes because the way that secret works by default is that all the sensitive information is stored on that CD and it's stored on uh, encoded as base 64, right? So you're probably aware that basic 64 can be easily decoded. And so that's not really protecting that information. And also on that CD by default, all the, all the information stored in that CD is stored in plain text, right? It's not encrypted, right? So there is another issue there as well. So there's different uh, ways that you can uh, um, use secrets on Kubernetes. You can maybe uh, use like a third party solution like uh, HashiCorp Vault or use the, the, the one from AWS as well. It doesn't matter. So just be careful. If you're using secrets with Kubernetes, don't use the default settings, right? Be, apply, there's some uh, configurations that you can apply to at least encrypt your secrets on that CD. And um, yeah, there's ingress and many different objects, right? And those objects are all, they all work. Uh, um, they, they can all be applied as a YAML file. And I tell that and apply that to my cluster using kubectl. And, and that depending on what I'm creating on that file that gets treated in the cluster exactly because of the desired state, right? I don't care how Kubernetes is going to do that. I just tell it, okay, I want this object created on my cluster and, and then, okay, apply that to, to the add CD. Once I send that information via kubectl that goes through the API server and gets stored in that CD, right? And now the, the controller is checking that, oh, something changed here. And oh, they want me to create this uh, this object. Okay, now deploy this object, and and everything happens really quickly. Okay, any questions so far? Let me see here. I think my cluster got created, so I'm just going to talk about kubectl, and then we're going to go back to the cluster. If anyone's still having uh, struggling or still having issues, please let me know. So basically the kubectl as we, uh, we we did on the Cloud9 instance, right? Is the CLI tool that allows you to control your Kubernetes cluster, right? It's it's a config file. There's a, a config file that uh, can be found on your home directory under slash dot cube. And I can so show you what's, where that's stored on, the, on our Cloud9 instance, right? It's very similar to the Docker CLI uh, for Docker containers. Let me see another question here. Is an API object like request parameters to the appropriate API endpoints? Request parameters. Mm, not sure I understand the question. Uh, API objects on Kubernetes, they are, they're, they're just like different, different objects. They have different, uh, uh, how can I say, functions, right? So basically, when you talk to Kubernetes and you talk to the API server, there is an endpoint for each each object, right? So let's say my Kubernetes cluster and like slash API slash pod slash create, right? So there is different endpoints. Everything gets gets uh, uh, convert from the API request and gets to the SCD, right? Once that's stored in SCD. And depending on, on the, which type of object that gets created on my cluster, right? I'm not sure if, if you can try to rephrase the question, uh, please, uh, so that I can I'll, I'll try to answer that better. I'm not sure if I understood correctly. But but yeah, so the, the syntax of the kubectl, right? It's very similar to, to the Docker command, the Docker uh, CLI, and and the reason being as well that they did that so so that people that were using Docker already could easily shift and start using Kubernetes without facing too many challenges, right? So yeah, that's it. Let's see, yeah, it's before we move on, let's go back to our cluster. 
And let me go to uh, the Cloud9 instance here. Okay. Share. A second. Okay. So you can see um, from the command that I did, right? Create cluster. It did a bunch of things here, creating the cloud formation and everything and should be uh, should be working right so to make sure that everything is working if you, as i said if you face any errors if there was something going on or or there was no not enough resources either either try to change the name of your cluster and try again because it could be just a temporary thing or the availability zone that eks ctl chose for you it wasn't uh there wasn't enough resources and once you try again with a different name, it's going to try in a different availability zone, or you can just change regions and, and do the same thing and, and see if that works. Unfortunately, I don't know if there is a way around that, if someone that works for AWS can tell me about it, but as far as I know, there is, there is no way, unless you create your own uh, uh, subnets and VPCs and configure that, that you know that there are resources available, but that can be like a, a soft limit from uh, AWS that I'm not very aware of. Okay, so let me, let me just clear this. Let's see, okay, good. You guys see my screen? Uh, is there another question there? Okay, no questions. So basically, let me do kubectl get nodes. Okay, so I can see here Right. Uh, this is the first command. I'm getting all the nodes that are part of my cluster. Right. And there is only one node, which is this instance here. Right. That's running, and it's selling the Kubernetes version here, um, one twenty, and yeah, it's ready. Right. So the instance is ready. If I go to the AWS console, I can see another instance created there as well, besides my Cloud Nine instance now. Right. Um, Let's see. Uh, okay. Here on uh, on the home directory slash dot cube, there are some stuff that was created, the config file, right? If I cat that, there is some some information about my cluster, how to access my keys and all this stuff, right? I'm gonna not gonna show everything. But basically, that's it. it. It's there. You can see that there is uh, uh, some certificates, the IP of my cluster, and all that stuff. Um, one thing that you need to be aware of on EKS uh, uh, clusters is that by default, once I create my cluster, the API endpoint, the, the, the API endpoint for my Cube API server, that's public by default, right? I know that's a long URL and, and it's it's hard to guess, but there are attackers, uh, people on the internet scanning uh, the internet for looking for those API endpoints. So if you don't need that uh, exposed to the internet, be, be, be aware of that and make sure that you configure that to be private. And we're going to see that very soon. Okay, so now that my cluster is created, we're going to deploy the other objects, uh, uh, actually the, the objects of, of my Kubernetes cluster. Right now, my Kubernetes doesn't have anything, right? So if I do kubectl get pods, no resources found. Uh, pod dash a, there is some resources, right? From the, the default resources of Kubernetes, uh, of the EKS cluster. Right. There are some stuff, core DNS, AWS, Cube proxy running, but there is no, no application run, right? You can see that they're all running on the Cube system namespace, which is the main namespace of my uh, control plane components, right? And let me see, Cube get pods, uh, NS or, or namespaces, right? So these can do like this, namespace or NS as a shorter version. Right, and, and as I said, namespaces are, are kind of like basically folders for organizing stuff on your Kubernetes cluster, right? And by default, I usually have those four uh, um, namespaces when I create my cluster. 
either un the managed or unmanaged version. Okay. So now let's create the objects, right? And let me go to this file here and I'm going to describe everything that's there before we apply this, uh, uh, this object there. So I'm creating a new namespace on the cluster objects, right? You can see here, and this is our different, every, uh, the way that YAML works, right? Every three dashes here, it, it's, it's basically a separate file or a separate object, but I, I put everything together, right? So that's easy to, uh, um, to understand. So I have one object being created here. That's a namespace called web app. Right, so basically I'm creating a folder to deploy my web application. This is an RBAC configuration. I'm creating a cluster row and a cluster row binding telling that the, um, the service account, and I'm gonna talk about RBAC and services account later, but basically telling the service account that I'm gonna use to deploy my web application, my, 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 uh, my pods running on this web app are running as admin, right? And, and so that's a bad thing. I'm, I'm I'm purposely doing a misconfiguration on my cluster, but that's for the exercise, that's for the workshop, right? By default, you don't wanna do that. You don't wanna do that. Um, there is also uh, a deployment, right? And I'm using deployment to deploy my, my uh, web application. I'm using, I'm creating like a Drupal deployment here because I'm, we're deploying a Drupal web application. And you can see here down below that the specs of the containers that I'm using, I'm downloading Drupal 8.5.0. And since there is no specification of which container registry I'm downloading it from, that's getting that from Docker Hub, right? So once I deploy that, I apply that object to my cluster, uh, uh, Kubernetes knows that, okay, I don't have that image here or, or whatever, whatever you want. So it, I'm going to download the by default, it uses Docker Hub to look for images, right? Unless you wanna apply, of course, that's not a good practice. That's not something that you wanna do because if someone compromises the Docker Hub or, or, or puts a malicious image there, then you're downloading an image to your cluster, right? So the best practice is to have your private container registry and store your images, your uh, uh, approved images there for you to download on your Kubernetes cluster. Okay, sounds good. So, and there is also a, a, a service. I'm creating a service here, which I'm going to use services or objects that, are, that I can use to expose uh, uh, my containers, right? And I, and I can expose just like, there's different types of service. The type that I'm creating here is a load balancer, which is going to create an AWS load balancer and I expose my Drupal web application, right? Which is running on port 80, and it's going to expose that on a port 80 of the load balancer as well. So as I said, there's different types of services. There's cluster IP, there is node port, there is a load balancer, and I think one more. Yeah, I forgot the other one, and no problem. I'll, 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 I'll remember. And this is basically, I'm um, adding, I'm adding just a, a kind of a flag here that I use. This is I use this this kind of setup to deploy a, a CTF challenge, right? So I have a flag here. I'm creating a secret, and I'm storing that secret as a a, a flag named CTF on the cube system namespace. And this is the 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 result of the flag here, right? The the the, the value of the flag. And it's basically base64 encoded. It's just a, a flag that we're going to practice and, and try to get that once we compromise the cluster. Okay. Sounds good. So uh, I, I hope you understood all these objects and we're going to apply that to my cluster. And you're going to see that that's going to be very uh, uh, quick. Let me go back to the environment. Let me go back to that uh, project that we downloaded from GitHub, right? and that's where my cluster underlying objects is. Um, yeah, just keep in mind that for the first file, uh, I don't know why I did this, but the first one I used dash, and the second one I used underline. So let's see if the command is correct. Yeah, it's using underline, so this one. So once I do this, Kubernetes apply dash F, right? 
So dash f means that I'm passing, uh, I'm feeding it a file. And so it's going to look whatever is in that file and apply that to the, cube, the Kubernetes cluster. Let me just apply that. And you can see that all the objects that were on that file were created, right? The namespace, web app, the service account, the, the deployment, the service, and even the secret. Everything is created now. So if I do now kubectl get namespaces, I can see that there is a web app namespaces there on the bottom, right? If I do kubectl get um, pods man dash n web apps. So now that I'm, I'm I just want some information from a specific namespace. I'm using the, the parameter dash n to tell Kubernetes. I only want the pods from this namespace, right? See, there's one pod running. What happens if I get this, like kubectl get pods? See, no resources found. Because if I don't tell Kubernetes the uh, kubectl, a specific namespace, it's going to look into the default one. The default one is this one here at the top, and it doesn't have anything there. That's why it's not going to find it. Right, so you need this. That's something that people that are starting to work with Kubernetes may 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 forget and may think, "Oh, I just created this. Where is it?" Right? If you don't specify anything, then it's all the objects that you create are going to create it on the default namespace. But as you can see from the uh, uh, object that we use here, I created this new namespace and I told to create all these objects on the web app namespace right except this one which is on the cube system okay see okay let's see another question where are these api objects going to do these get sent to etcd and then some pulling service check for new additions resources using apis yes yes so the api objects they go to etcd as a like a a key value store, right? So the, there is this stored on that CD, and the controllers, the the cube controller manager with their controllers, they check at CD and see what change. Do I need to create this object? Oh, oh yeah, this I need to create this service or this load balancer or this pod, and then it talks to other objects like the, if it's a pod, talks to the cube scheduler and tells, okay, create this pod on my cluster. I, I don't have that on my cluster right now. And I need, etcd is telling me, etcd is the source of truth, right? etcd is telling me that I need this cluster, this object there, so create that for me. So some objects in Kubernetes are, are like, how, how can I say, they, they have a, a physical representation, right? So for example, a, 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 a pod, it creates it, it, it creates itself there on 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 the when when it's created on the cluster. Yeah, I can see it. I can see that there is a pod and there is like something running. There is a container and all that stuff. Some other objects are just kind of uh, how can I say? They're kind of they're more abstract. They 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 exist there. They exist in Kubernetes and stuff. But there is no kind of physical representation of that object besides the configuration at CD. Right, so it's just like uh, uh, some stuff that Kubernetes do to 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 kind of encapsulate that object in some specific configurations, right? Such as deployment, stateful set. It, it's just a way for you to uh, uh, to help you deploy uh, containers in, in like different with different characteristics, right? Basically that. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. If not, yeah, let me know. Okay, so now I have a web application running and we expose that web application to the internet via the load balancer, right? So now I can get the service of my web application, right? And you see that there is a service called uh, uh, Drupal-SVC load balancer running here. And, and this is what we need, right? The external IP. So this is the IP of my web application that should be running there. So if I click on that, if I copy that URL and open on my browser, and I'm gonna show you right away. Uh, let me share the screen again. Doo -doo -doo -doo. 
change change here to my other tab if okay here oops yeah so you can see here that there is a drupal uh, uh web application set up on on this url right and i need to install it i need to configure and that's what we're going to do right and uh, um but yeah basically okay it's running I, I, i'm exposing this drupal container to the internet with with only that cluster only that container right and with the service load balancer of course if you go to the aws console where, where the load balancers are you're going to see that there is a load balancer created there as well i'll, I'll show that later but yeah so that's what's being used my container is running inside my cluster my kubernetes cluster i'm using the load balancer to expose that and i'm accessing that through that long url so don't use the same URL that I'm using because your URL is probably different than mine, right? Depending on, on where you deploy your cluster. Um, so let me install here. I hope that nobody messes with my uh, Drupal. Uh, what I want to do here is choose the language, use the standard one, right? We need to configure the web application needed running so that we can exploit it. Uh, I'm gonna use SQLite, which is the database here, uh, so that I don't I don't need to set anything. And yeah, it's going to install, and there's some just a, a few minor uh, uh, configurations there. But basically, we all need to do that if we want to exploit and 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 play along with our uh, exploiting the application, right? So Dodge coins, I can set anything here. Like this, this doesn't matter. This configuration is just to complete the, the configuration of my website. But but yeah, cloud village at .com. I, I'm not gonna use any of that. So don't worry about remembering the 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 username or password or or, or anything because we're not gonna use that. We all we only want to do that to set up our um our Drupal web application. So I'm gonna use just a strong password just in case that anybody tries to mess with my uh, application. But yeah, that's it. Okay. So, um, yeah, okay, it's fine. So yeah, now I see the Drupal web application is running, right? And, and you can see that's working. I'm logged in as admin. I can post, I can like, I can do anything. It's, it's a regular Drupal web application. It's just using an outdated version because that outdated version has a vulnerability, right? And now we're going to, uh, now we're going to exploit that vulnerability. Okay, no more questions. So yeah, let me go back now to, to the slides. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we're going to exploit it and the vulnerabilities that we're going to do. And then we go back to this web application. Okay. Let's see, change the slides, you're good. So what we're using today, uh, um, and, and as we mentioned in the beginning, right, we're using threat modeling to, to attack this, this web, to see what vulnerabilities are in the application and then POC it, right? So that's one of the things that I do during my daily job, right? So analyzing new technologies, especially cloud and container technologies, um, check the possibilities of, of any kind of like a hypothetical attack and create a threat model for it and then try to POC it, right? Try to create a proof of concept for that as well. Um, one of the things that we like to use is the MITRE ATT&CK framework, right? And the, as I mentioned, the MITRE ATT&CK framework is, is a, a, a very well-known framework on, on the among the InfoSec community, right? It's like a, a knowledge base of tactics and techniques based on real-world scenarios, right? So you have the, the MITRE attack uh, for enterprise, you have the MITRE attack for Linux, for Windows, and you have even one for cloud, which is now called IAS, Infrastructure as Service, 
for for uh, the all the cloud major cloud providers, but we didn't have one for um, for containers and Kubernetes until this year, right? So what uh, what we did was uh, there was a, 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 a one matrix released by Microsoft uh, in April last year, April 2020 that they they kind of use the MITRE attack framework structure of tactics and techniques this this matrix approach to uh to create their own their own matrix like based on the data that were, they were seeing on azure on their aks clusters they created okay so these are the techniques that attackers are exploiting in a kubernetes environment right and so, but that's not an official MITRE matrix, right? A MITRE project. So in, in December, December last year, the, the MITRE team for uh, cloud and containers, they released, like they published a blog post asking uh, for help for, from the community to collect data about real world scenarios and, and what attackers were doing on those environments, right? So either, uh, uh, previous attacks that happen, real world attacks that happens to organizations such as Tesla and um, I think there's, I don't recall others now, but yeah, there's many others. EKS as well, they used as a, as a baseline. So they're, they're trying to gather real world data and real world information or, or, or honeypot information from what attackers were doing there. So since we're, we do this uh, research on, on, on a daily basis, we had a lot of data that we reach out to MITRE to provide them with that data to help build this matrix. So the, the work started uh, basically last year, beginning of this year. And in April this year, they released the official MITRE attack for containers. And, and I, I kind of add and Kubernetes as well, because that's not, that's not what, how MITRE calls it. But there are some techniques here that are very specific to uh, Kubernetes environments, right? Con or or orchestrated container orchestration environments. But yeah, basically, this is the MITRE, the official MITRE attack for containers that was released in uh, April this year. So you can see that there is the, the common tactics there, and there is those those techniques. There are very some of those already existed on the MITRE framework, but they didn't have the context of container environments, right? So they add that reference or the technique specifically or that threat actor. And, and some of the techniques are brand new. They didn't exist before. And so that's that was a, a kind of a, a cool project that I, that I did that I helped build with, uh, with Miter. And, and there's the link there with the matrix, but it's all official matrix, matrix uh, for the Miter attack framework for uh, containers is this one. And and yeah, there is different techniques here, um, tra different tra actors actively exploiting those environments on, on, on one honeypot that we deployed. Um, it took less than 24 hours for the attackers to compromise our environment. And we didn't, we didn't like publicize that. We didn't, we just deployed the Kubernetes uh, environment with a vulnerable web application. And in less than 24 hours, the attackers had, uh, um, compromised the cluster, right? And even broke out of the cluster and compromised the, the cloud environment that, that we set up the cluster in. And they started deploying big instances to mine cryptocurrencies, right? That, and that's usually the end goal here with Docker and, and Kubernetes environments. When attackers compromise those environments, oh, like 90% or 95% of the times, the end goal is to either um, compromise the, the, the already the containers that are already running, or deploy new containers to mine uh, Monero cryptocurrency. Right? That's that's usually what happens most of the times. Okay. So what I did with the threat modeling part was even before this was done. This diagram here was done even before the Mitre framework was released. It was done last year. And what I did was exactly create this threat model diagram based based on the the, the Microsoft attack mate the Microsoft Kubernetes threat matrix. And and so 
I created like a scenario where, okay, which are the steps that uh, an attacker can do to compromise a web application running on a vulnerable web application running on, on a Kubernetes cluster? Excuse me. So yeah, here we have the initial access, right? The web app running in a pod. So we have that already. We set up that already on AWS, right? And, and the web app has an application vulnerability. And you're going to see that really soon. We're going to talk about the vulnerability that that uh, this Drupal, outdated Drupal application has. And the attacker exploits this RCE, right? They exploit this, this vulnerability, and then they get a shell inside the pod, inside the container, right? And from there, they can do other things, right? And, and so this is kind of the diagram that I created uh, um, to help me understand what what a, an attacker was able to do and and that's when i did the poc to validate that and of course then then that's where this kind of this workshop came from right from this diagram there as well so i can i uh i don't know if you can see the whole diagram if it's if it's too uh too small but i can share just the, the diagram link later with you so yeah attacking kubernetes if we have set up this, like I call the website, Dogecoins, right? If you have the Drupal set up now, uh, um, you should see kind of a similar screen, a screen to that, to that screen, okay? Okay. So what we're going to do, right? What we're going to do today is exploit this. Yes, yes, I can share the, the attack scenario diagram. Uh, um, I don't have the link handy right now. Um, yeah, it, someone is asking if I have this attack scenario diagram uploaded anywhere, sorry. Um, but yeah, I do have it. Uh, I just don't have the link handy uh, with uh, like a, a high, higher resolution version, but I can share that together with the slides, uh, no problem. So, so yeah, the initial access here, right? So that's when we start now attacking Kubernetes. And I know it took, it's, I'm sorry it took too long to get here, but I wanted to everyone uh, follow along and, and be everybody on the same page to set up the environment and so that you understand the basics of Kubernetes. So now that we can start attacking it, right? And that's that's what's important here. Like you know, once you understand the basics, now it's just practicing different scenarios and different attacks, and you, maybe you can do that on your own later. Um, so two main uh, entry points of a Kubernetes cluster, right? One of the entry points here is a vulnerable web application, right? And we're going to see why, why is that. This vulnerable web application has an RCE, right? A remote command execution. Uh, as you can see, the CVE from 2018 and we're going to use that exploit code on that GitHub uh, uh, to do that, to exploit that vulnerability, right? Uh, other ways that uh, Kubernetes clusters got compromised before was the exposed dashboard. So in previous versions of Kubernetes, there was a, a dashboard that was created by default that allowed you to kind of manage your cluster in a, 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 a in a like, graphic user interface way, right? Uh, but that got deprecated and it's not uh, uh, it's not deployed by default anymore. You can still do it, but it's not it's not deployed anymore uh, by default. And, and that that dashboard has some vulnerabilities, some issues. That's how one of the uh, one of the, the cluster attacks that happened a few years ago on a Tesla. That's how they compromise their environment. They, ex they expose a dashboard. And, and so that's not the case anymore. And, and see, even the reason why on the, if you look at back at the Kubernetes threat matrix by Microsoft, they kind of deprecated that, that technique, right? Because since it's not deployed by default, let me go back. You can see here as the initial access expose a dashboard is, is kind of dep deprecated, right? There is other options, right? On the initial access, there is using cloud credentials, compromise, container registries, and all that stuff. But I'm going to focus on the application vulnerability here. Um, there is also the Cube API server, right? And if the Cube API server is exposed and, and it's not properly configured, right? You can even deploy pods 
through the, the, the API server, the API endpoints, right? So, so yeah, we, it's the same thing with the Docker daemon API, right? If that's exposed and there is no authentication, there is no, and, and the person which with access to that can, um, can have, we can have like uh, uh, access can reach the API endpoint, then, then they may be able to do some things or get sensitive information there, right? Uh, the Cube API server endpoint is public by default, right, in some managed services like EKS. Um, Sally asked the question here, do you have any issues with AWS having vulnerabilities in your clusters? Um, with this workshop, right, we're not, we're, we're just deploying a vulnerable cluster and we're, we're compromising it ourselves. We're not stalling any malware. We're not running scans on on AWS. And yeah, we 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 had some issues in the beginning, but but like with our honeypots, but we changed the, the way that we deployed and and also the environments. And and yeah, uh, I don't think we're gonna have issues with that this scenario today. So yeah, but if you do, please let me know. And and we're going to shut down everything later. So it's not gonna be up for, for a, a, a whole lot so that you don't get your, your cluster compromised by like someone else, right? We don't want that. Okay. So one of the main things, uh, um, one of the main issues as I said is the API endpoint, right? Reaching the API endpoint externally, uh, that can be a problem. You can see two examples here accessing um, on an uh, unmanaged cluster, the API server of Kubernetes runs on port 6443, and on uh, EKS, it runs on, on port 443, right? And if I have the URL of that API endpoint, I can just do a curl request to, to that URL, and I can get some information about my, uh, my API endpoint. So let's, let's try to do that first. Before we go into exploiting that, Let's try to do that first. Let me go to the um, EKS console. Oh, let me share my screen here. Sorry. Keep forgetting that. So yeah, I'm here on my AWS console and I went to EKS, the Elastic Kubernetes Service. And I'm gonna check my cluster here. And I can see that I have a cluster running and it should be at least only one if, if it's a brand new account or, or something like that, right? And that's my, my the cluster that we created for this workshop. Um, so this is kind of the console of your, kind of your control plane, right? Oh, it's telling me that I'm using an outdated version. There's a new version available. Uh, I can see my, uh, I see my configuration here, right? So this is my API endpoint, and that's usually exposed by default. Let's see if we can if we if we can open a new tab, and we can see that. Yeah. Okay. Let me show you here. We can either do a curl or or um, or just open a new tab in the browser. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna show you here. Okay. So yeah, you can see here that I got like an error, right? Uh, let's see, API version uh, or just version. Oh yeah, yeah. So so yeah, I got just accessing the URL there. I got an error, right? And I got like, this is kind of a JSON error and a 403 telling me forbidden user system anonymous cannot get path slash, right? And and okay, this is okay. I, I don't have access to that and, and that's fine. But you can see that this, this API response is very specific to Kubernetes, right? I, and, and you can already tell that by the, by the format that there is a Kubernetes cluster running here, right? And if I go to slash version, which is usually open to anyone by default, I can see the Kubernetes version that's running. I can see uh, right the Go version of of my uh, of my Kubernetes and all the platform and all that stuff. So this is 
kind of a, a, a information leak, right? Um, that it's exposed by default and, and uh, in many EKS clusters. Right? If you deploy the cluster like we did by default with the default settings, it's going to expose, once someone knows this endpoint, of course, it's a long URL, but you can see that this is running on EKS, right? And basically what changes is, is this, this kind of uh, uh, sequence, this string here, right? And, and so people can try to, attackers can try to scan the web and scan for, uh, for any kind of open clusters that may be running a vulnerable version or, or are like exposed by default, right? So they, they want to look for that. So yeah, be careful about that. Uh, let's see, what else can we do here? Let's go back to the, let me go back to the Cloud9 instance. Now we're going to download the, download the, the exploit that we're going to use and, and, and use it, right? And basically that. So let me grab that again. Uh, one second. Okay. So this is the URL of the exploit. Let me share here with everyone. Uh, let me share the screen too, sorry. Okay. So yeah, this is the GitHub of the exploit uh, for the CV, right? It affects uh, uh, Drupal, right? A.5, so A.50, that's the one that we're using. Um, just a couple of things here um, before you just kind of uh, clone this, right? If you git clone and, and download this to your uh, Cloud9, you need to have Ruby running installed it should have that on your cloud nine uh, but it might require it might require some like dependencies uh, which is a gem and then we're go i'm going to do that with you together if if that happens we just install the dependence and we can run right so all we need right now is the the um the load balancer url uh from where your application is running so let's go back there let me go to the cloud nine. Sorry for the switching screens. And that's that's safer. Okay. So yeah, I'm gonna need I'm going to need that URL, right? So just save that for later. Uh, save it like a notepad or something, because you're going to need that for exploiting the cluster. Right, and you can you could do that from uh, any other uh, uh, machine. I'm just going to do the uh, through the Cloud9 because it has Rub installed already, and so it's going to be easier for me to do that. Uh, so, let's see, I'm going to add that command as well to the Google Doc, and that, and. Okay, each clone, let me just get out of this. Okay. So I downloaded the the exploit, which is which is written in Ruby from GitHub, and now I can see that here, right? If I take a look at the, at the description there, basically I just need to run the uh, exploit and set up a target, right? A URL of the vulnerable Drupal application, right? And that's the URL of the load balancer that we have already, right? So let's try to run that and see if that works. If it doesn't, then we install the dependency on, uh, on, on Ruby and should work uh, as intended. So, yeah, basically drupalgadon.rb and the URL of my load balancer. And let's hope that works. Yeah, it's missing. Yeah, 
the high line. See, it's, it's missing a dependence here. Cannot load file, high line import. I think it's sudo gem install high, high line. Yeah, so another command, let me add that to the Google Docs. I added that already there. Okay, so it should work now. Let's fingers, let me just clear this. Fingers crossed. Oops, not yet. Why it didn't work, maybe. Let me open the terminal again, just in case. Ding. Oops. Let's try one more time. See if that works. If it doesn't, I'll do from my own machine, no problem. Mm. Why is that switching? One gem installed. Okay. And still not work. Oh, maybe I need. Oh, okay. I need the the path probably. Yeah. Uh, let's try. Let me show you from my machine, and then I'll figure out how how to solve that for everyone. Okay. Let me open a terminal here and I'll share my screen to me a second. Yeah, that works. Let me share my screen better. Sorry about that. This is the problem with live workshops, live demos. I'm gonna share my terminal. Okay. So yeah, I I went to the Drupal get on folder where where the exploit is, right? And because I have the Ruby and the dependencies already installed, that worked already here. And basically I did Drupal get on the RB and uh with the URL of my load balancer, right? Where my application is running, right? So I think there is some issues with the with the path of Ruby um, and on the Cloud9, and we can we can figure out that soon. So let me show you what's what's going on here. So the exploit is running, right? It's looking for for the Drupal stuff. It's it's collecting so you can can get information about my. Uh, my web application where it's running and all the stuff and and i get a shell here right so let's see um when i see it's running as the user www data from the web server or where this um this container is running right um let's see um See. see, I can see from the files already that, right? If I, if you known Drupal before and know the file structure of Drupal, you can see that there is a Drupal uh, uh, application running. Um, yeah, so this is already. I'm inside where are where I am right now with the exploitation of of the the web application. I'm in a shell inside the pod that's running the Drupal container, right? Um, so what else can we do here, right? What else can we uh, uh, can we see? How, how do I know that this is a, 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 a cluster, like this is running on a cluster, right? So some things that can help you understand um, where is it running uh, um, the environment, right? It's checking the environment variables, right? I do env. I see a lot of environment variables, right? I don't want all of them. So let me do env client grab dash i cube. Let me do that. 
oh, now I see there is a lot of Kubernetes environment variables and I can see them all together here. And I can see uh, um, the, the IP address of my, uh, of my API endpoint, my API server, right? You can see the port that's running, right? And so there is a lot of information here. So this is already telling me that this, this is running on a Kubernetes cluster, right? Uh, let me just add that to the column. Let me just add that to the, sorry, to the Google Docs. Um, and I crash IQ. Uh, what other, what are other things that I can do here, right? I'm inside a Kubernetes pod. What can I do? What else can I do? Right? It's it's not just like it's it's running inside a container, right? And and um, but what what else? What information can I have? Another thing is that Kubernetes stores their uh, service account tokens on each, on every pod. And that account token is used for the pod to talk to talk back to the API server, right? And so, if I go to the, and they are all on the always on the same location, all on the same uh, directory. So if I go here to um, run secrets, I think I need to increase the font a little bit. Secrets, uh, Kubernetes.io, service account. Let's see if it's going to show me. I don't know if it's because of my shell. No. Let's see. Yeah, my shell is not great. I should probably deploy a new shell. Okay. Yeah. Now I can see it here. I can see there's three, three files here, right? The certificate, the namespace, which is basically where where the the, the vulnerable web application is running, and the token, right? And these can be used for me to talk to the API server. There is another tool that can be used as well, which is also it helps uh, um, getting information about the the containerized environment. And this tool is called in my container. Post this. I'm gonna post that to the Google Docs. Right. Secrets and Kubernetes.io slash. Yeah. And step nine, we're going to look at the MI container. So what we're going to do is use download this to to the um, to the pod that I'm running and execute it. Right. So let me go back here. One second. Uh, where is it? Okay. Um, yes, let me share that. So let's see if that's going to work. I have the command somewhere here. Yes, uh, yeah, here. Da, 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 da. Basically, actually, I want this one. Um, yes, I posted that to the Google Docs so that everyone can follow. Uh, I'm going to try to do that through my shell. Yeah, it worked. So basically, I went to the tab folder i use curl to download the uh, binary of a my container from the github right and yeah change it 
permissions there and execute it, right? So you can see this is the output. This is the output of the MI container tool. And it shows the, the container runtime is cube. It shows it has namespaces, PID, namespace true, user namespace false. It shows if there is some, uh, if there are any protections here, um, Linux security modules activated like AppArmor or uh, SC Linux or SACOM, right? So you can see that the AppArmor is unconfined. There is some capabilities that you can see here as well. And also syscalls that are blocked. So I know that as, as well. Um, so this gives me a lot of information already, right? So um, it, it's, it's good for an attacker to kind of do like a, a recon of the internal environment, right? I can even let's see if I can curl. I think I can even curl from here. Yeah, see? The same thing that I, uh, oops, not gonna work. Um, so the same thing that I did on accessing the tab, uh, the URL, I'm doing that from inside the pod. And since there, those are environment variables, it's going through, it's getting those and getting the Kubernetes, the cluster information, right? So that's interesting. Another thing that I can do is, um, you probably heard about the API metadata, right? The instance metadata from, uh, from uh, cloud providers, right? They all have one, AWS has one, Google has one and, and, and Azure as well. So from a compromised pod, if that's enabled, you can reach the API metadata as well. And I'm not gonna show my, I'm not gonna show my API keys, but I can show you some stuff that works. Let's see. Where is it? One second. And... Yeah, let me get, okay, let me grab that first. Let and find my, my cheat sheet here. Sorry about that. Where is it? Okay. Uh, okay, I'm not finding that. So yeah, uh, I'll, I'll show the, the API metadata soon. Don't worry, let me just... So another thing that you can do is you can, from the pod that you're compromised, right? You can talk to the API server too. And as I said here, like I, I just did the curve to the API server, but if I do it like just slash API, you can see that I got 403 uh, error as well, right? So it got forbidden because I'm not sending any kind of uh, authentication, any kind of token, it's not working. But as I showed that there is some uh, credentials, some service account information, the certificate and the tokens inside the pod that I compromised, I can use that to uh, feed, feed into my per request to talk to the API server. So let's see. Go back there. So I'm going to create two environment variables here. Let's see if they work. I'm going to create the token environment variable that's using getting the token from that directory and the namespace as well, getting the namespace from, from that directory. And now, now I'm going to do a curl request but with that pull request, I'm sending the header authorization bearer token to to this uh, um, to this API, right? The API server. Oh, uh, didn't work. Maybe it's not. Maybe it didn't work. My no. Mm. So I need to copy, probably copy that. Fine. Oh, fine. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm gonna show my token, but it's fine. We're almost, I think we're almost at the end now. I don't know if you're gonna have time to cover everything. But yeah, let me try to run that again. And instead of token, I'm going to send that here, right? Let's see, uh, unauthorized. Hmm. Something changed. It's not working. Okay. No problem there. It's fine. Let's go back to slides and uh, I'll, I'll figure out what's going on. Okay. Yeah. So let's see where we are right now on the, on the slides. Okay, so we, we've done the reconnaissance. We, oops, the slide's not sharing yet. Did someone add the slides? Can you see the slides on my screen, on the screen? Okay, thank you. So yeah, we did we did some internal reconnaissance. We inspected the, the Kubernetes environment, we inspected the environment variables, right? And and the service account token. We even used a tool from outside, right? Externally on GitHub, downloaded that tool and executed. Uh, yes, yes, probably yeah, there is some probably some issues. I'll I'll check it out soon. I just don't wanna get stuck because we're almost <laughs> almost out of time. And I want to complete that, but I'll, I'll, I'll take a look here if we have more time. Um, yeah, so we did an overview of that, right? There is many stuff that you can do here on uh, on your container. There is also a possibility of doing, because the, the way that this uh, uh, cluster is configured, it, there is also a possibility of, of doing even like a post, uh, post exploitation or persistence on the cluster via a privilege escalation, right? So there is this technique uh, posted by Duffy Cooley, who works at uh, Isovalent now. He used to work at Apple, where he created, he posted this uh, kind of command using kubectl to deploy a, a, a container with, with like a privilege container that has access to the worker node, right? Um, and, and on the, the right side here is the kind of the structure of the JSON format that he's using to override uh, um, that container that he's deploying. Basically, what, what's happening here, and, and he's using like um, host PID equals true, right? He's using the, the privilege container true as well as the security context. He's, uh, um, he's doing a lot of, uh, like different techniques to access the the worker nodes, right? And 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 that's one of the ways to to do that. And how that happens because I'm allowed with with that service account that we created, which is uh, um, which is giving me a lot of permissions. Um, I can I can do that. I can deploy a new pod, and that's one of the, one of the ways of escalating privileges in a Kubernetes cluster is deploying a privilege pod on that cluster if I have permissions to do so, right? Of course, I would need to download and install kubectl on that pod first to run it and do the privilege escalation. And if we have time, we can try to do that too, as well. Um, that can be a little kind of tricky on managed clusters because some the way that uh, uh, they, they handle those privilege escalations, but but yeah, let's see if that works soon. Um, let me talk about the defenses before before we do some other attacks. Otherwise, we're not going to have time, right? How can I protect my cluster from attackers? Right? Isn't Kubernetes secure by default? And where do I start? Right? Uh, um, um, basically, we can see that Kubernetes is not secure by default by by many reasons, right? So let's take a look at some different uh, things that you can do to protect your cluster. Um, one of the 
basic things, right, is taking a look at when you install your cluster, and this this applies only to unmanaged cluster where you have access to the to the control plane. Um, but one of the things is is just integrity monitor, right? Understanding what files are created when you install Kubernetes, uh, the recommended ownership and permissions, and those are from the CIS Kubernetes benchmark. And if, if you have the integrity monitoring set up on that uh, node, anything that changes on those files, either permissions or, or, or ownership, then you should be alerted, right? Something suspicious is happening because usually those don't change very often. And those are the recommended permissions. The CIS Kubernetes benchmark, if you haven't heard about it, it is like a, a very extensive documentation with best practices for setting up your cluster on uh, on Kubernetes environments and setting up like configuring it correctly. There is also another kind of hard, uh, a recent document that was published by the NSA called the Kubernetes Hardening Guidance. I think it was released a couple of days ago, so it's pretty recent. But as far as what I looked from the document, it has some has some issues, right? Uh, they talk about pod security policies, which is something that we're going to talk about soon, but those are, are being deprecated or deprecated already. Um, they, they don't mention much about the encrypting at CD, right? Which is the database of Kubernetes. They only have a small example at the end and they're using the Docker files with the tag latest, which I don't think it's a good idea using the latest tag. And that's something that you learn when using containers. So yeah, I think the, the CIS benchmark document is a better one to use for deploying your, your cluster securely. Um, there's also the same thing with the worker nodes, right? It's just different files that are installed on in the, the worker nodes with, with different ownerships. And that's from the recommendation from the CIS benchmark 1.51. There, be, there might be a newer version. But yeah, take a look at that on the CIS uh, uh, Benchmarks website. Uh, I talked about Kube system uh, namespaces already and, and, and how they can be uh, um, dangerous. Like, as I said, there is no security boundary between namespaces, right? So the Kube system namespace, which is the main namespace of your Kubernetes cluster, and it, it's like an inception, right? Kubernetes uses Kubernetes to run Kubernetes. Um, so all the pod, the main pods of your uh, control plane are on the Kube system namespace. And so if an attacker has access to those, then then it's it's likely that they can do a lot of damage. Right? So be careful with that Kube system namespace. You don't want to give access to that namespace to every user on your cluster. And the idea is that you can use RBAC, which is role based access control to protect that namespace from being accessed. I already talked about the API server, how that shouldn't be exposed and how we can get some information from, from the API server and see if there is a, a, a cluster running, right? Um, yeah, there is some information that you can get running some comments if you have access, right? In this case, we don't have access to the control plane, right? Shell access. So we can't see the configuration of the API server, but, but yeah, you can do that if you do, if it's an unmanaged cluster. Um, the kubelet, right? And we talk about the kubelet on the architecture diagram. It's the agent that runs on each node of your cluster, right? Make sure that all containers are burning in the pod. And uh, two main security settings for the kubelet is restricting kubelet permissions and rotating the kubelet certificates. There is another thing that uh, there was a blog post that I published earlier this year uh, talking about how attackers are using a kubelet exploit to compromise different clusters. Um, let me see if I do, yeah. So the way that it works, just as a, a quick overview, and I'll post the link for the blog here. Um, it's not like I'm not trying to, promote anything is just uh, that's a technical blog on, on what we've analyzed from a very famous uh, uh, threat actor. Yeah. 
the way that they do is they compromise your environment and once inside your environment they scan the your whole internal network for uh, uh kubernetes clusters running inside your network right and and they specifically target the kubelet right with a kubelet exploit that's being known uh, uh for a while okay so take a look at that blog post if you if you uh if, if the uh, if they can share the link but but yeah there's something that's happening on uh on the wild in the wild as well uh as i said the, Kub the kubernetes benchmark is a guidance for establishing secure configuration posture for kubernetes um there is over 120 security checks for your kubernetes cluster and it has been developed by uh cloud native and kubernetes security professionals with much more experience than than i have so Rory McCoon from Aqua Security and Liz Rice from Isovalent and many other contributors, right? And there's also specific ones for EKS and GKE. And I think there is one for AKS, if not already. Uh, so because the way that the managed services work, they, they are a little bit different, a little bit different than the standard the unmanaged Kubernetes. So yeah, it's better to take a look at the specific documentation for that. And that's, I think that's the best uh, uh, guidance out there for protecting your uh, Kubernetes clusters. Let's see. Um, if you don't wanna, <laughs> if, if you don't wanna run, in, and if you don't wanna check your benchmark, uh manually right because it's a long document it has a lot of checks that you need to do and the way that the benchmark works is that you have uh, um you have this the setting that's recommended okay here's the setting then it has how to check if the set if that specific security setting is properly set up and then if not set up it has another command for you to run to change that setting to the proper like configuration, right? So the benchmark is a PDF file. It has a lot of stuff and, and like many uh, uh, best practice configurations, right? But it's very hard to do that manually. And especially if you have multiple clusters, that's gonna be proper, probably unfeasible for you to do, right? So uh, Aqua Security, which is also a company that, that works with uh, uh, container security uh, products, they, they provided, they created this tool called KubeBench, which is open source and it's free for everyone to, to, to use, that they check whether Kubernetes deploys securely or not, right? You can validate it against your CIS Kubernetes benchmark, right? And it's developed in Go. So it's open source. And let me post the link here uh, uh, on from GitHub, KubeBench. Uh, I think there is a dash. Yeah, found it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you can use that, right? So I, I just have an example here. I don't know. I don't think we're gonna have time to run KubeBench on, on our own cluster, but it, it's very easy to do that. And you can see an example of an output here showing that my cluster my, uh, uh, has a lot of uh, vulnerabilities or, or maybe like it failed a lot of best practice from the CIS benchmarks, right? A lot of fails and warnings and whatnot. And it checks everything from the master node, the API server, the etcd, and worker nodes as well. So it's interesting too. So if you, if you have cluster running on your organization and you want to see uh, um, their status and, and how they look, if they were configured or not, it's a good tool to, to use and, and get a, a quick overview of the uh, if they're compliant with some best practice from the benchmark. Um, other stuff that you can do is use some image scanning, right? You, before you deploy your containers on your cluster, the idea is to uh, scan them for vulnerabilities or, or outdated dependencies. And there's different image scanning tools uh, uh, out there. I'm not going to talk about them. There, there's different uh, open source and, and, and enterprise ones. Uh, all, all those here are either free or open source. So you can take a look at those. Um, there's even a, like a native Docker scan command that you can use now, which is based off uh, a SNCC. 
but yeah, there is different others. Okay, now you scan the container image and you deploy that image on your cluster, right? But how do I know that someone has compromised my cluster, some compromised that container, that pod, right? That where that's when the, the cloud native runtime protection comes in, right? And and probably if we had like a, a, a tool such as like Falco, which is an open source tool as well that belongs to the CNCF. Now it was donated by Sysdig, and it, it, it probably would detect some of the attacks and, and the uh, uh, shell that we got inside the container, right? So what Falco does is Falco parses Linux kernel syscalls at runtime, right? It's using a technology called eBPF, extended Berkeley packet filter, which is kind of a, a, a technology that many uh, container security uh, companies are using to create their own uh, their own tools, their container security tools, right? And it has a lot of visibility on the system, so you don't need to install agents and, 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 and like mass, mass with the container deploys, sometimes deploy sidecars and all that stuff. So Falco is a rule engine, right? It has a easy and powerful, powerful rule engine. You can create your, rule, your own rules for your vulnerabilities. Uh, it generates alerts based on the threat detected. I'm even using the um, the Falco Sidekick T-shirt today that I got as a as a contributor to the Falco project, and it detects unexpected behavior on a cluster, right? And and the Sidekick is another project that runs with Falco and it gives you better kind of visibility on 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 what Falco is seeing right? on on the logs and everything. Um. Here, I, we're almost out of time, but yeah, there is other settings that you can apply to your pods, right? Of course, CPU and memory is limiting resources to avoid denial of service. That's something that you can do. You can apply a security context as well. There's a different set of, uh, of, um, of settings that you can apply on a security context. Some of those are, are here. Uh, and as I said, the, the Linux uh, security modules, right, the, the kernel features, SecComp, Apiarmor, and SE Linux can also be used to apply that to your Kubernetes. Be careful because Docker has some default uh, profiles for those, for AppArmor, for example, and SecComp. But when you use that on Kubernetes, Kubernetes doesn't inherit that from Docker. So you need to apply that as well. And yeah, uh, pod security policies is something that got deprecated. It's not being used anymore. Uh, it was a way to apply the security context as a whole on a cluster level. And there is new features now, new tools that you can use, some alternatives such as OPA Gatekeeper or Kyverno, which are open source tools as well, that you can create policies as code to say, OK, only deploy this container if it doesn't have any high or critical vulnerabilities, right? Uh, there is a, 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 a new pod security. Now, I forgot to update the slide, but there is a new pod security. It's not PSP, but there's a new version that's being implemented by the Kubernetes SIG, SIG, SIG off and SIG security team, right? There is a, a, it has been approved already. Um, yeah, I won't have time to talk over our back and at CD network policy. And yeah, let me finish with the basics and I'll share those slides with you. And if we want to talk about those other things, our back, uh, network policies and audit logs, we can chat later. I, I'm, I'm available on, on social media, Twitter or LinkedIn. But basically what I wanted to give you here is just an overview of Kubernetes an overview of the, the security issues and also an overview of how to secure your cluster, right? It doesn't mean to be, it's not an extensive uh, uh, workshop. It's not an in-depth workshop. So keep that in mind. Um, the, so I just want to leave you with, with a few, few basic rules with Kubernetes, right? Uh, first thing is update your environment version early and often. As I said, there is new versions being released uh, uh, very frequently, now three times a year. And the version 1.22 is the most up-to-date one uh, recently, that was released recently. Don't use the cluster admin user for your daily work, right? Treat, 
treated like root, right? So the reason being why, why we got to uh, uh, exploit that vulnerability and then uh, get a shell on the pod and then do bad stuff on the cluster was because the service account of that pod had too many permissions, right? We can even deploy new pods and escalate privileges and all that stuff. So be, be aware of that. If you can, use managed Kubernetes services, such as AKS, EKS, or DKE, because they have better security defaults, and you don't need to worry about the control plane because they, care, they, care, they take care of that for you. And as I said, check out the CIS Kubernetes benchmark for more security best practices. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this workshop. There is some references here, and I can share the uh, the whole command list that I use, and you can try to replicate that on your environment. And I'm sorry if some of the commands didn't work, but I, I'll take a look and, and make sure that's fixed uh, before I share with you. So yeah, thank you.